Hey everyone, welcome to this video on deep learning. Now this is an interesting video and an important video when it comes to deep learning. As we progress in today's session, you'll understand what is deep learning and why you have to learn deep learning. And when we talk about deep learning, we'll typically talk about neural networks. So you'll understand what will be the structure of a neural network. How does it look? What are the various parts of my neural network? And you'll also learn about activation function in neural network, regularization in neural network. And at the end, I'll also talk about the common architecture whenever we are performing the deep learning activity using the neural network. So we will look at the common architecture of the neural network for performing the common supervised machine learning task. And at the end, we'll also look at the implementation of deep learning task. So let's get started and let's start by understanding what exactly is this deep learning. Now, when we talk about this deep learning, this deep learning is a subset or a subfield of machine learning. And this is concerned with the algorithms which are inspired by the structure and the function of the human brain. And we call it as artificial neural networks. So this is a structure which has been inspired by our human brain. As you know, when we talk about human brain, our human brain cell is composed of multiple neurons and these millions and billions of neurons are connected together in the format of a complex network. And here, when we talk about deep learning, in this scenario, we are trying to process the information just like we have the connection that we have in our human brain. Now to help you visualize what exactly is this network that we talk about when we say deep learning, this is how a typical or a high level representation of a neural network. Now on the left hand side, this is the picture which talks about the neurons that we have in our human brain. Okay, these are the neurons in my human brain. We've got the brain cells which are connected together in the format of a network and the information will flow through this brain cells. Now, when we talk about deep learning, this deep learning, even we have the connection of neurons and my neurons are connected together in the format of various layers. So just like my one neuron is connected to another neuron, I'll have multiple neurons present over here and these multiple neurons are connected in the format of a layer. So using this series of neural networks, which are connected in the format of individual layers, we will be able to find the patterns which is not at all visible with a traditional machine learning approach. Now you might be wondering why do we prefer machine learning? And why not uh, like why do we prefer machine learning? And when we are already preferring this machine learning, why do we have to go for deep learning? So that's the question that you might have, isn't it? So you we already prefer machine learning right now to find the patterns in the data. But why should we think about deep learning? So guys, just want to let you know, whenever we are working with machine learning algorithm, in the scenario of machine learning algorithm, we've got the curse of dimensionality. When I say curse of dimensionality, as the number of features in my data set grows bigger and bigger, the capability or the generalization ability of my machine learning will is, is going to suffer. Since the capability and the generalization methodology of my machine learning is going to suffer while working with this, we have to require a method which doesn't suffer from this curse of dimensionality. And another thing that we have observed is if my data set is very large, then it is very difficult for my machine learning algorithm to find the pattern in such data set. But if you think about it, since we have all the data is now digitized, We've got trillions and trillions of GB of data, which is lying with us. Now, if I want to do the analysis with large data or a big data, I cannot simply make use of machine learning. The reason is when I'm doing the machine learning, I'll have to do the feature engineering by my side. I'll have to analyze the data. I'll have to get the important features. Then only I can get some of the amazing accuracy on my machine learning model. So in such scenarios, deep learning comes to the rescue. The best part of this deep learning is here in the scenario of deep learning, even as the amount of data grows, 
the performance will keep on improving and that's the best part about this deep learning guys even when the amount of data grows the performance actually increases in the scenario of deep learning compared to the traditional machine learning approach because of all these reason whenever we are looking out for a complex data where we have very large data set and we want to find a pattern between the data then our first choice will be checking out with deep learning provided the machine learning is not able to help us in that scenario now that you have understood what is deep learning and why we require deep learning let's have a high level look at the structure of a deep learning neural network now if i want to describe the structure at a very high level this is how it would look like now this is a screenshot from tensorflow this is just to give you a visual representation of how does my neural network would look like on the left hand side i've got the features now features are nothing but the inputs if i have three columns then i can say we've got three features in my given data set if i have five columns i would say we've got five five features in my given data set now in this scenario i've got two features x1 and x2 are two features now this input is connected to my hidden layer as the name clearly suggests we've got two hidden layer over here now the reason that we call it as a hidden layer because this is hidden so this i this hidden layer is connected from my input layer or to another hidden layers so hence we call it as a hidden layer now the role of this hidden layer is is to get the input from my input layer okay once it gets the input from the input layer it will perform two things one is a linear summation and along with this it will perform the activation so these are the two things that will be done by my individual neuron so here it clearly says we've got four neurons in this layer I mean we've got four neurons in this layer so we've got a two hidden layer and each layer has four neurons so each boxes that you see over here so this each box represents the individual neuron okay so at the end we've got the output and we call this output as an output layer this is where the output will be generated and the input will be sent from my input layer so from this diagram one thing is pretty much clear right now when i talk about my neural network i'll basically have my input layer through which input will be sent and we'll have the hidden layer where it's a series of collection of neurons which are structured and which are connected together in the format of a network in this example i've got two hidden layer and in my each hidden layer i will be having some set of neuron and in this example we've got four neurons along with my hidden layer we've got the output layer now this output layer is going to describe the output now using this common structure we will be able to perform and we will be able to identify some of the complex relationships between the data now in this example i'm using two features and using the two features of my data set i'm able to classify the data points and you can clearly observe during the classification this classification is not a linear classification because i've got the data points structured in the format of concentric circle so this concentric circle contains the blue region and this outer region contains the orange orange region now in order to find these kind of non linear structure in data i am able to do this with the help of neural network in an easier manner compared to the machine learning approach now if i want to do this with the help of machine learning approach i'll have to make use of polynomial regression or i'll have to make use of decision tree where it will be a step kind of a lines where i'll be drawing continuous set of lines which will be parallel to my axis and then i'll be drawing the decision boundary or i'll have to make use of svm do the additional data transformation or apply the polynomial regression so even if i do all those things there are a lot of data transformation will be involved in case of svm data transformation is involved in case of deep learning in the case of decision tree so 
my decision tree will have multiple steps so it will be hard to interpret in such scenarios if i make use of random forest then in case of random forest i'll have to make use of multiple decision trees again so these are the challenges that we are going to face while working with machine learning whenever we are having the non linearity present in the data structure but with the help of my neural network using the series of neurons which are connected together in the format of multiple layers we will be identify we will be able to identify such complex relationship in a data set in a much more efficient manner so this is the advantage of my neural network and working with this neural network now let's have a deep dive into my individual neuron so here i've got a deep dive over here so let's consider this individual neuron now as i mentioned in this individual neuron two things will take place one is linear summation and the another one is activation linear summation is nothing but finding the dot product between the weights that is flowing to that layer and the features so dot product between the weights okay dot product between the weights and the input features in my scenario x1 and x2 are inputs so w1 x1 and w2 x2 is the dot product between weights and the inputs and along with that we are going to add one more term we call it as a bias term so this is called as linear summation now on top of this i am going to apply the activation activation is going to help me to scale these linear summation output in a required range for example i can apply sigmoid activation function to get the output in the range of 0 to 1 or i can make use of tan h that is hyperbolic tangent function to get the output in the range of minus 1 to plus 1 or i can make use of relu activation function to ensure that i am ignoring the negative values so we've got various activation function and we apply on top of this activation function to get the output in a required range and this operation will be performed in each and every layer so each and every layer will form this similar operation and the output from a previous layer will be sent as the input to the further layer and this is how the output of my individual neuron would look like and these neurons yes these neurons will be again sent together for the next layer and that is how the output gets generated so this is the working of my deep learning neural network in order to get the better understanding and see the best part about this neural network and explore some of the other details that we have inside this neural network let's go to the tensorflow playground and let's see it in action so i'm now in my tensorflow playground website now this is a official website by tensorflow team guys now the best part is you can play around and construct your own neural network and start experimenting now for the demonstration purpose here i've got two features that we have right now that is x1 and x2 and i'm trying to predict the overall pattern that we have in this given data set on the left hand side you can clearly observe we have been given with the data set this is the data set that we have been given and this is one class and the remaining points that you see which is in orange color that is belonging to another class now the expectation is i want to train this neural network so that i'll be able to classify my blue data points and my orange data points in an efficient and an effective manner that's the overall agenda of this neural network now in this neural network architecture we've got two hidden layers so this is one hidden layer which has four neuron and this is one more hidden layer with two neuron if i want to increase the hidden number of new layers i can just hit the plus button and this will add some more layers for this neural network i can hit the plus button to add further neurons to my individual layer see we've got further neurons in my individual layers see i can increase this see this is how i can create multiple neurons in each layer 
as as intuitive as possible guys now i'll just remove it for now i'll increase this to the three neurons now can you observe the connection between one layer to another layer see x1 is connected to this neuron x2 is connected to this neuron so every neuron in my previous layer is connected to every other neuron in the next layer so this kind of architecture we call it as dense architecture where every neuron in my previous layer is connected to every other neuron in the future layer this is a dense architecture and guys can you observe the lines that is flowing around see you can see a line that is going for each of this neuron if i hover my mouse over that lines it says wait see i've got the weight as 0.11 this is the weight of 0.48 and we've got the weight of minus 0.37 weight of 0.28 0.35 minus 0.35 so these weights that you are seeing right now these are the initialized weights or these are the random weights that has been assigned for my neural network i just want you to note down this okay once the training is completed i'll come back and i'll show you the effect as how it actually works okay for now just think that there are some values just for the documentation purpose i would say i've got this value of this weight which is 0.5 okay i'll keep it for now now this we have seen what is this overall network structure this is a net dense network neural structure that is dense neural network structure now inside this each neuron as i mentioned two things will take place linear summation and the activation so we'll talk about activation very shortly for now here we've got some various options okay i'll select the activation as relu okay this is a commonly used activation function which will help us to find the best parameters in a easier and a faster manner hence i have selected this activation as relu okay now once this is done so we've got the overall network structure that look like this and currently with the initial values okay if i do not use any classifier the loss that i'm getting is 0.505 that is the loss that we are getting training loss and the test loss and on the left hand side we've got the ratio of training and test data and the noise noise is nothing but whether we want to add some any noises in the data set i don't want to do anything i'll keep the remaining data as it is that is the batch size of 10 okay now once this is done okay let's do one thing let's see what happens if i click on this play button once i click this run or a play button this is going to start the training so before i do that okay so since we have changed the parameters the weight that we have is minus 0.13 i'll do one thing i'll just change it to 0.5 so that it is easier for us to remember so my weight value that i have set is 0.5 right now for this line now i'll begin the training that is i'll click on this run button and let's see how does the overall output would look like now guys if you observe closely i'll just press this pause button now this has done the training i mean as the training progressed we can clearly observe that my blue data points have been separated from this orange data points in an effective manner i'm able to clearly yes i'm able to clearly separate this blue ones with the orange ones with this i can say that my neural network architecture which we have just trained it is able to find the overall pattern that we have on this data set now that's the best thing now let's come back and let's look at the value of weights so if i come over here so the value of weight has been changed to from 0.5 to 0.050 see it was initialized as 0.5 and it has been now changed to 0.050 which means the weights has been updated as the training progressed in my neural network so the overall idea whenever i'm performing the training on this neural network is is to find these values of weights see you can clearly observe each weight that you have right now so each line that i have right now each connection it has its own weights so at the beginning of my training i will have the values of these weights to be initialized that will be some random values now once i perform the training 
I want to find the right value of weights so that my neural network can understand and can identify the complex pattern that we have on this data set. And this is what happens when we perform the training using deep learning neural network. Okay, so I'm able to find the overall pattern in this data set guys. Now here, whenever I'm performing the training, the number of neurons is one thing that is going to affect me. Apart from this number of neurons, the other things that is going to affect me during the training and which dec decides on the accuracy on my neural network are the activation function, regularization, learning rate, batch size. So these are the various things which is going to affect as we perform the training on my neural network. So to summarize, what we have learned right now is, I'll just proceed with the training. So to summarize, a neural network is consist of series of layers. And in my each layer, I'll have the collection of neurons. And I will be having the connection between one layer to another layer. In total, I'll have three important layers, input, hidden, and the output layer. And the overall idea of this training is to find the values of weights and the bias term so that once the training is complete, I'll be able to identify the complex representation that we have on this data set. And here, these lines that you see over here, these are the weights. And if you look at the dots, see this dot refers to the value of the bias term. The bias value assigned for each and every neuron. And this is how, yes, this is how the neural network will be trained. Now, while performing the training of this neural network, in order to find these values, in order to find these values, that is the weights values in the neural network, it makes use of a technique that's called as back propagation. So the name is back propagation. Now, the reason that we call it as back propagation because here, the first step that I'm going to do is I'll go ahead and perform the first forward pass. Forward pass is nothing but finding the value of y hat. Now, once I find the output of this entire neural network, I'll go ahead and I'll compute the value of loss. And once the value of loss has been found, next, using this value of loss, I'll calculate the value of derivative of my loss function with reference to every value of my parameter that is W and bias term. And on the basis of these values, I will be updated and I will, be, I will be updating these parameters in a backward way. Hence, we call it as back propagation, where once I find the value of loss, I'll go back and I'll update the values of my weights. So this technique is called as back propagation technique. Okay, now that you have the overall idea about how the training will happen, Let's go ahead and let's look into the individual component. That is, we'll start by understanding the activation function that we have in my neural network. So talking about this activation function in the neural network, this activation function decides whether my neuron should be activated or not. In other words, my neuron what will be the overall outcome of that individual neuron? It will be decided by this activation function. So this activation function will decide whether the neurons input to the neural network is actually important or not in the performance of the prediction using this simpler mathematical operation. So this acts like a gateway. This acts like a gateway to decide whether this information should flow out to the other neuron or not if it is flowing out how much it should flow out and that's the role of this activation function in neural network and whenever we are working with neural network we've got basically three types of activation function one we've got the binary step activation function two it's called as linear activation function and three we've got non-linear activation function so binary and linear activation functions as the name suggests it's a straightforward activations that we have right now now coming under this non-linear family of activation functions 
we've got various activation functions. We've got sigmoid activation function, hyperbolic tangent activation function, ReLU activation function, ReKLLU activation function, parametric ReLU activation function, ELU activation function, softmax, swish, GLU, CELU. So these are the various nonlinear activation functions that we have, which we have the opportunity to specify these activation functions whenever we are creating the neural network. Now, by specifying this various activation function, we can control how the training would progress. Now, let's come back to our TensorFlow playground. If I come back to my TensorFlow playground, here I have selected one of the activation functions that's called as ReLU. Now, I'll change the activation function to TanH and I'll click on the training. See, the output of my TanH activation function, the resulting is something like this. Okay, now if I change it to sigmoid and if I click on the training again, so you can clearly observe that the training is little bit slower compared to the other activation function. You can clearly observe even more than 100 epochs have happened and still I'm unable to understand the overall pattern in my data set in at least in an effective manner. It is still now trying to improve it slower and slower. And you can clearly observe that one of the main reason that this is taking more time because because of this activation function, the sigmoid activation function, it, it is little bit math intensive. It is little bit math intensive. And now by the end of 600 epoch, that is 600 or 700 iteration, we are now able to classify the data points in an effective manner. So my activation function is playing an important role when I'm doing the prediction of my neural network. Now let me do one thing. So here from this overall option, I'll select the linear. So linear activation function is nothing but I'll use the values directly as it is. Now if I make use of linear activation function and if I try to train it, so let's see how does my fit would look like. See, I'm trying to learn in a linear fashion that is without introducing any activation function that is without using any non-linear function over there now you can clearly observe even though i am in the training of 400 or 500 epochs i am still unable to find the pattern in the data set and the loss it has been struck over there it is not not at all going and it is not at all going to reduce it this the reason because we have the data which is non-linear in nature. I cannot, no matter how my, how I draw the straight line, I cannot fit all the data points in a straight line. And that is the reason having the non-linear activation is important, especially when we have a data which is not linearly related. Because if you remember from the linear regression assumption, if I'm using the linear regression, we expect that there's a linear relationship between the features and the target. Now, obviously in this scenario, I don't have a linear relationship. So hence, I cannot use this linear activation function. Okay, now apart from this activation function, here we've got one more component that is called as learning rate. Now this learning rate decides how my update should happen as I perform the training in my neural network. So this is the one which will decide the way in which the updates will be performed. So this is very important. If I keep my learning rate as very high, I'll give you an example. So if I simply begin the training with 0.03, I'm able to perform the fit and I'm able to reach the better accuracy, at least able to find the pattern in the data set with just 58 neurons. Now I'll change the learning rate to three and with the learning rate as three, okay, I'll refresh it and I'll hit the training button again. Now observe guys, observe, observe what is happening in the screen. See, it is just jumping around. It is just jumping around with the value of loss. The reason because it is unable to settle down to a place where we have the right values of gradients. So when my learning rate is very high, my deep learning model will not be able to reach the right solution in an easier manner. 
Now let's do one thing. I'll go ahead and I'll change the value of learning rate to very small learning rate. Well, if I set the learning rate to very small and if I begin the training, now observe. So previously with the learning rate as 0.03 or something, I was able to perform the fit easily by the end of 50th epoch. Now the way this is getting progress, it is getting progress in a very, very, very slower manner. Now I'll do one thing. I'll just change it a little bit. I'll change it to 0 0.001 and let's see. See, it is getting changed. The value of loss, it is getting changed in a slower manner. It is happening in a very, very slow manner. Now I'll again increase it to 0 0.001 with 0 0.001 now it is faster but slower than before but it is faster comparatively to the faster of what we have seen just now do you agree with me are you following with me so let me know in the comment section so here you can clearly see as my learning rates see as my learning rate becomes lower and lower we can clearly observe it takes more time to train. It takes more number of epochs to train. So that is the role of my learning rate whenever I'm training my neural network. And guys, there's one more parameter that we have right now that's called as epoch. Now epoch decides as how many number of updates should happen on my neural network. So how many times my entire data set has to be going through this forward pass and perform the gradient operation? How many times my entire data set has to complete the forward pass and the backward pass or the backward propagation? Okay, so that is decided by number of epochs. And on the left hand side, we've got the batch size. Now this batch size decides as how many number of data points that I have to pick each time. Now each time for the individual update, should I pick one data point at a time or should I pick 10 data point at a time or should I pick my entire data set at a time? So all these things are decided by this batch size. Okay, so this is how we are going to train the neural networks and the various parts of my neural network. Now that you have understood the overall parts of this neural network, let's have a look at the problems that we are going to face whenever we are working with neural network. One of the major problem that we would face while working with this neural network is vanishing gradient and the exploding gradients. So vanishing gradients is a scenario where as my network becomes deeper and be deeper, there can be a scenario where my gradients would not be able to flow to the initial layers. So that is a scenario of my vanishing gradients because the gradients become smaller and smaller and it will have little or no effect on my parameter values itself. And that is a scenario of vanishing gradient. And this is a scenario when we have the learning rate, which is very low. And we've got the exploding gradient. Exploding gradient is a scenario where my values of my gradients explodes and it is unable to convert to the right solution. And that's the scenario of the exploding gradient, guys. So these are the problems and we've got various techniques to mitigate this one is instead of using the sigmoid and tan h activation function it is recommended that we use the activation function such as relu or parametric relu or cellu activation function and using that we can try to minimize these problems the other options that we have right now is we can take up the activities of initialization to ensure that these things are reduced or we can also make use of the techniques like gradient clipping to get the values in a required range. So these are some of the strategies that we can use to deal with these problems. So I have mentioned that we've got a lot of various activation functions that are available to us in the scenario of deep learning. Now let's see how we can choose the right activation function. Now, I have got some guidelines for you. I hope it will be helpful for you. So 
here when we talk about this activation function we prefer to work with relu activation function especially in the hidden layer and we make use of this sigmoid or tan h and the and the uh, other related activation functions and we use it in only during the output output layer guys depending on the problem that we are dealing with and it should not be used in hidden layer because they are going to make the model more susceptible to the problems during the training because of this vanishing gradient gradients concept as i mentioned earlier okay and if you are working with the layers especially which has the depth greater than 40 layers it is recommended that you use this swish activation function so these are some of the common guidelines that i would recommend while choosing this activation function now let's have a look into a scenario and let's look at the common architecture of my neural network for a specific task that we'll be dealing with so here when i talk about my output layer okay in the scenario of my output layer this is very important because this output layer gets changed depending on the task that i'm dealing with if i'm dealing with the regression task then i will be using the linear activation function in my output layer now if i'm performing the binary classification task then in such scenarios I will prefer to work with sigmoid or logistic activation function. And if I'm performing the task of multi-class classification, then I'll prefer to work with a softmax activation function in my output layer. And if I'm dealing with multi-label classification, then it will be a sigmoid activation function. So this is how my output layer configuration would look like. Now that you have the overall idea about this deep learning neural network, let's go ahead and let's see how we can create a neural network by making use of TensorFlow library. So let's get started and let's start coding. Okay, I'm now in my Google Colab. I'll start by loading the necessary libraries. So the task that I'll be doing right now is the multi-class classification. Now here, in order to do this multi-class classification, first thing is we would need the data. The data set that I'll be using is called as Fashion MNIST data set. It's an inbuilt data set provided by TensorFlow. So let me start by importing the necessary libraries. We'll confirm whether we have the TensorFlow installed or not, and then we'll get the data set. So I'll import TensorFlow as TF, and then I'll display the version of my TensorFlow. So if I execute this, this will give me the version, the version that is currently installed in this Google Colab instance is 2.8.2. Okay, now along with this, I'll import my NumPy library and I'll import the matplotlib library. Okay, so once this is imported, next here, I'll download the data set. So as I mentioned, I'll make use of fashion MNIST data set. And this fashion MNIST data set is like the hello world program for the computer vision. So that's how famous this data set is. Okay, so here in this data set, in order to download this, first I will be importing this data set. I'm going to say from tensorflow.keras.datasets, I'll import fashion. MNIST. Now, once I import this, I'll say fashion is equal to fashion MNIST. Okay, so this is going to fashion MNIST dot load underscore data. Okay, this is how I'm going to load the data. Now, when I call this load data, guys, when I call this load data, what happens is it's going to generate the image in the format of tuple, the data that I'll get in the format of tuple. So let me just modify it on my right hand side as well. I would say train images, comma, train labels. And I'll get this test images, comma, test labels. So in this way, I'll just load the di data directly. So this has loaded the data directly from the TensorFlow library. Now, once this is done, let's go ahead and check the properties of these images. So train images dot shape, 
so here we've got the shape of 60,000 comma 28 comma 28 which means I've got an individual data okay I've got the individual data so individual data is of the shape 28 by 28 and in total we've got 60,000 data so speaking from the data set so I've got 60,000 images and each image is of the shape 28 by 28 this is what we can observe from this given data set now if I display the test images so if I display the test images this is how the text images would look like we've got 10,000 images for the test data now if you check back to the official documentation page of MNIST so we've got total of 10 classes so for the benefit I'll just go ahead and load it from the official documentation page and these are the various class names that we have so we've got t-shirt trouser pullover dress coat sandal shirt sneaker bag and ankle boot so these are the various classes that my data would belong to okay now if I go ahead and display the labels so if I get the first label over here so the first label belongs to the value 9 so if you want to get what is that 9 would refer to you can say class labels 9 so class labels 9 is referring to the ankle boot so the test image that I have right now in the first data that belongs to the ankle boot that is what it clearly says now let's go ahead and let's pre-process the data now before I do that let's get some clear idea how does my image would look like or how does this individual image would look like I'll get an individual image let's say I'll get a first image that I have right now okay and in order to create the plot I'll see it like this I'll say plt dot I am show okay next I'm going to add plt dot title and for adding the title I'll say class names okay so class names train labels and I'll get the first label that is the value at the zeroth index and I'll say plt dot show now if I execute this so this is going to tell me that the first image that I have right now in my training data is belonging to the ankle boot see you can clearly see this belongs to the ankle boot now I'll do one thing I'll also switch on the color bar that will give us the overall idea about the values that we have in this data set so plt dot color bar so this will add the color bar to the right hand side so we've got the values ranging between 0 to 255 frankly speaking guys we'll have the value till 255 and this is how the data would look like now I'll just load another data now if I load another data so this is a data where it belongs to the t-shirt or top if I load an another example data train images 2 and train images labels 2 so this is an another image data so which belongs to the class of t-shirt top okay so this is how my data set would look like now we see how does this data would look like now let's go ahead and let's perform the pre-processing on this data set so the pre-processing that I'm going to do right now is I'll first get the data into the range of 0 to 1 in order to do this it's very simple I'll say train images is equal to train underscore images divided by 255.0 Next, I'll repeat the same activity for my test images. So this will bring the data to the scale of 0 to 1. Now, once I have pre-processed the data, the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to construct the neural network. From, the, from our few minutes back, you now know how does my neural network would look like. Now, in order to generate those kind of structure, we first define by creating the model as sequential so I'll write it like this I'll say model is equal to tf dot keras dot lay sequential okay so I'll define it as sequential 
Now, if I want to add my individual layers, I can say layers is equal to now inside the parenthesis, I can configure how does my layers would look like. So this time I'll say inside my Python list, I'll mention and I'll configure my individual layers. My first layer, okay, my first layer, I would write as tf.kras.layers.flatten. I'll perform the activity of flattening because I have got my data which is in multidimensional format. Now before in feeding into my neural network, I will have to ensure that I'll convert it into a single dimensional vector. So in order to do that, we've got a pre-processing layer that's called as flatten layer and I'm applying that layer over here. So input underscore shape is 28 comma 28. Now once I configure this flatten layer, now this flattened output will be sent to my next layer. I'll say tf.kras.layers.dense. Okay, I'll have an uh, dense layer and I'll have the 128 units of neurons. So this 128 is nothing but the units. And since this is an hidden layer, as we have learned, we'll have to use the activation function as ReLU for the better working. And this is a single hidden layer that I'll be constructing. So after that, I'm going to add my output layer and I'll call it as dense layer. And as you know, what is dense? It's a, it defines there is a connection between one neuron in my previous layer to every other neuron in my next layer. I'll have the units as 10 and in my multi-class classification, as we have learned already. So the activation will be softmax. So this is how we are going to define our neural network. Okay, so let's create this neural network and once my neural network is created, I'll display the summary of my model. If I display the summary of my model, so we've got a flattened layer, we've got a dense layer and we've got an output layer. Perfect. So we have defined the model architecture. Now, once the model architecture is defined, next we will have to compile the model. Now, this is an important step. During this step, we are going to specify how does my neural network get trained as the training proceeds. I'm going to say optimizer is equal to Adam. Okay. And I'll specify my loss is equal to tf dot keras dot losses dot sparse categorical cross entropy and I'm going to say from logits is equal to true okay and then we'll use the metrics for reporting as accuracy now once the model compilation is complete we can now go ahead and perform the fit on my given data set now in order to perform the fit let's say model dot fit train images comma train labels and I'm going to run for let's say 25 epochs and if I just execute this this will perform the training on my neural network okay this will perform the training on my neural network so currently the training is getting progressed so we can see the accuracy that we are getting at each step Okay, now once the training is complete, we can then go ahead and perform the evaluation on the test data. In order to perform the evaluation on the test data, so let it execute and I'll show you how we can write the code. I'll say test loss comma test accuracy. This is equal to model dot evaluate and we will have to mention our test images comma test labels so once we specify like this once we specify like this it is going to help us in evaluating the new data it will help us in evaluating the new data that is the text data and tells us how does our data would look like so let's wait for the execution to complete and once the execution is complete you will get the better idea so we've got the training completed by the end of 50th thing that is by the end of this 25th epoch not 50th by the end of this 25th epoch we have the accuracy of 94% that's great if I come down 
we are able to reach the accuracy on the testing data with the accuracy of 0 0.8898 which means we are getting the accuracy closer to 89% with a very simple neural network architecture that we have built. So what we have done in this video is in this video we have learned what is deep learning what are the various parts of deep learning what is activation function how to specify the activation function what is the neural network architecture for a common task and then we have implemented the neural network for the common task of multi-class classification using tensorflow library so with this we come to the end of this video so thank you so much for watching guys and i look forward to seeing you next time